Up internet, you are listening to Bucket List Music Reviews. My name is Jason, and I'm today joined by a very, very special guest. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, man? Uh, my name is Jeremy Hebert, and I play guitar in Comeback Kid. And I couldn't be more stoked. Uh, it is the wee hours of the morning, and you can both expect us to say some terrible, terrible, not coherent <laughs> things. <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll be I'll be making coffee slurp sounds because that's keeping me going here. So. That is how it goes, man. That is how it goes. <laughs> um, I unfortunately did not wake up with enough time to make a coffee, so let's see how much terribly I can do this. Already, that's terrible English. So <laughs> we'll get right into it, man. Um, you guys just came back from yet another leg of the tour in support of your brand new album, Outsider. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about how that last piece goes? It went it went really good. Um yeah, we were uh sorry, I'm just uh helping I think I had prefaced this interview by saying my son would be interrupting me. Yeah. Uh, his video <laughs> didn't come <laughs> sorry, one second. I gotta get this going. Otherwise we're gonna get interrupted the whole there we go. Hey, no worries, man. Uh sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about the last leg of the tour that you just got home from. All right. Well, we were just yeah in Europe for uh, three and a half weeks, and uh, it was you know kind of the the general thing a band our age does is hit the hit those festivals hard in Europe, and uh, yeah, we were getting on some uh, pretty wild festivals, especially with the nuclear blast connection out there, um, playing some metal festivals that uh, are, you know seeing the name come back in alongside Cannibal Corpse is pretty crazy for a band like us, but uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty nuts just being able to share the stage with a bunch of, you know, bands that uh, we're both fans of and, uh, you know, just like legend type uh, type bands. So yeah, it was, it was really cool. And then of course, you know, those are usually on the weekends and then in between we do some club shows, which are, uh, you know, that's where we feel most at home. So yeah, it was good. Perfect, man. And, um, you know that's actually a perfect segue, uh, segue bringing up the nuclear blast thing. We'll come back to the tour uh, tour talk in a moment. But um, with the recent label swap to nuclear blast, are you able to you know kind of divulge how some of those details have been going for you and what it what it's meant for the band being on um, going from something like Victory to uh, a very predominantly metal label like Nuclear Blast? Right. Yeah. Uh, at first, I guess I guess the way it came about was uh, you know our, our contract was up with Victory. And so we, you know, we were just talking to different labels or whatever. And uh, one of our, one of our um, confidants, I guess, uh, in, in, with the uh, with the band, it would be our, our booking agent in uh, in Europe. And basically, we listen to whatever he says or suggests, and we're like, "What do you think? Like a band like like I should be considering?" And he's like, "Have you considered Nuclear Blast?" And we're like, "No." And he's like, "Well, you should. I'll get you in touch with with uh, you know someone I know there." So, uh, you know, at first it seemed like a weird idea, but then the more we thought about it, um, you know, we see that they're signing some older hardcore bands like Agnostic Front, Madball, whatever, um, you know, and younger bands like Broken Teeth. Yeah, for sure. So we were like, maybe this doesn't sound as crazy as it initially did, because, you know, I'm 42 years old, so I'm fairly aware of, uh, you know, how the label has operated over the last 30 plus years and, you know, predominantly a uh, straight up metal label. Right. Yeah, but for sure. I think, I think, um, you know, they wanted to take on some of the, some of the, uh, you know, elements of hardcore that, uh, you know, kind of, I don't know how to, how to describe it. I had a, t I had a conversation with the, uh, with the owner recently and he was like, I'm not just a metal guy. Like I love hardcore too, but he's like, this was just like a natural thing for, for me to do any, it, it almost sounded like he wished he had, he had kind of branched out a little, little sooner. So yeah, it just, it just seemed to, to make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, from our vantage point, we thought, you know, this could open up some doors for us. Cause there's always, you know, that, that crossover element that comeback it has, like, you know, we feel like we can be on a bill with like punk bands, like good riddance, Pennywise, rancid, whatever. But we also feel like we could, uh, you know, be on the, 
the, the, the metal end of things as well, too. Like, we're not a full-on punk or metal band, but, you know, we feel like we have those elements where it's it's not a big stretch to be able to appeal to some of those bands as well. So, yeah, we decided that that, that was that was, uh, that was a, a logical chance worth taking. Yeah, absolutely, and that, and that's always been a little bit of the, the the gray zone with hardcore is that it it's you know it really it's always been you know the baby of both um, you know metal and punk in the sense that it's got the punk aspects, it's got the thrash metal aspects, and everything like that. Yeah. It, it, it was it was a birthing era thing, you know, um, as sure. you very much got to live. So. <laughs> Uh, and it's also hilarious that you say that that, that because it is very true. Nuclear Blast has been um, uh, assembling a lot of hardcore bands, and it almost feels like a, just this very odd midlife crisis where the label itself just feels like it hasn't done enough with its life, so it's just going to start banging out the best records it possibly can right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is. It well, like, it looks like they, they they conquered metal. Why not conquer hardcore? Too? Yeah, it's like you know what? I got bored. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's crazy some of the acquisitions they've been making and stuff like that. And and like as a reviewer, I can tell you without question, some of my favorite albums out of the last two three years have all been coming from Nuclear Blast. It is ridiculous, and I'm starting to think that they're putting crack in these things. But um, <laughs> coming back to uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about Nuclear Blast and everything like that because you can just. Totally screwing up my roadmap here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know the 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 band being on the road. It's always you've always been a very tour heavy band, like you said, always yeah. on very diverse bills and stuff like that. And as a band, um, having to do this for as long as you have, be it both in Comeback Kid and as well as Figure Four way back in the day. Um, what are some of the road essentials? What are the things that uh, you absolutely cannot live without? What can we find on a Comeback Kid writer and stuff like that? On a writer, oh, or even uh, just you know is, what mean, you need for yourself, be it um, uh, even just personally while on tour to keep you sustained and able to keep doing this. Well, me personally, time and space. I <laughs> yeah. I'm like the the weird introvert in the band, so like as soon as we're loaded in, set up, whatever, um, I always I should I shouldn't say always, but ninety something percent of the time will go for an hour to two, three, four hour walk by myself. Not because I hate my band, but just because I just need my, some time to myself just so I can, Reset time. I don't know, yeah. maintain a clear head, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's how I roll. Other people are going to be going for walks in groups. Um, so yeah, that's something I need. Um, other than that, I'm pretty, we're not, we're not too crazy. Like, I mean, the older we get, the more we do treat ourselves to, you know, filling up the rider with a few more uh, goodies that we like. I mean, when we started, it was just, you know, water. And if we had a jar of peanut butter, cool. But, uh, <laughs> you know, now there's, you know, a few different kinds of alcohol. We like to, we've you know, have bread. a few, uh, <laughs> few treats. What's that? Yeah, yeah, we've added bread. Um, you know, having maybe a couple of Gatorades or kombuchas goes a long way, too. So, there you go. yeah. No, the, the, older, the older you get, the... Uh, the 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 comforts of life I think you know help keep just the the life on the road um, happening. We're not we're not in our twenties anymore where we can uh, just sustain ourselves by having fun. We have to you know be able to be able to afford the the hotel rooms because sleeping on floors doesn't work anymore because <laughs> I'm 42. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I can if I have to in a pinch like here and there, but uh, that used to always be the thing, right? Like announced from the, the stage, like hey, if anybody has a as a place to crash, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a butcher's floor or a hay loft in somebody's barn, it's like, that'll do. <laughs> oh, make no but, mistake, uh, my three and a half has been safe haven to, well, I mean, not many a band, but at least a few that have been like, well, I guess a three and a half works. <laughs> Um, no and uh, you know all of that to say gluttony does come with age and 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 um a little less patience comes with with having to put up with the 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 harsh uh you know bits of the road but i guess also having a little bit of label backing can make that a little easier too (laughs) yeah Yeah, i think i I mean just have tonight yeah it's it's it 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 kind of gets to a point where it's like well this is if this machine's gonna keep on uh keep on going we we're gonna to have to spend a little bit of money on just like uh, rounding off some of the edges of uh, of that uh, you know DIY hard hardcore tour style thing that we we did. So yeah, I mean we're not we're not traveling in fancy tour buses all the time with all the bells and whistles, but we're still in a van and trailer or whatever in North America. So hammering it down in a van, I can I can definitely see that every time you guys come around. But it, and yeah. that's, <laughs> that's that's also a very respectable thing because I mean you guys have done so much in your careers. It's it's insane. Um, and it's and it's also a very humbling thing for for people still on like say my level or or you know however you want to put it um, 
to remind us that like there's never really an end to it. You always got to push. Yeah. You know, yep. and, that's and it's really like impressive it's, that you guys have done it first. The joy is in the journey, so yeah, it's like you're, sure. you're you're always trying to accomplish goals, but if you're not moving forward, then uh, it just kind of doesn't seem like anything anymore. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, so we'll get to we'll touch a little bit on the record for a little bit. Um, so uh, Outsiders been out for about um, how long now? It's been about six months, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a little more, almost mm-hmm. a year actually. It came oh, wow. out in it's September last year. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, listening to this, I, I have barely slept. This is very much in the morning. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> Jason normally does his homework. Um, so it it's an incredible, incredible record. I was absolutely blown away the first time I heard it. Um, and as, oh, as, as a fan since, you know, the Wake the Dead days. Um, and so I want to get your, a little bit of your feedback on, on how you're feeling about the record first and foremost and how it's been received. Yeah, I mean, it's the cliche to thing to say... Uh, you know, I think it's our best record yet, but I think collectively we, we do feel that way. Um, every record is kind of just a bit of a an evolution off of, you know, from the from the last one. And, you know, there's always little things that you learn from, you know, not only bands that you uh, admire and are influenced by, but also just from your, your last record and your experience in the studio. It's like, ah, you know what? I wish I had done that just a little differently. And now I can remember that for next time, you know, so you, you're constantly learning, but at the same time, I think it's all just with this, this kind of music, it's also important to realize that you can't overanalyze everything. So it essentially the music has to come from you. Like you can't just like, you know, shit out a record and because the label wants to, it has to come from, you know, inside. And that's why we don't put out records as quite as often as the labels want us to, because if they had their way every 18 months, 24 months, there'd be a new comeback at record, but we have to do it when we're, when we're ready. And, uh, you know, we took our time with this one and, uh, you know, we spent more time in the studio than I think we, we had before, but we just wanted to get it, get it right. So sure. yeah, we're stoked on, stoked on how it turned out. I mean, I think the people that have been listening to us the whole time can see that it has gotten a little heavier. And I think a lot of people are thinking that's because me and Andrew don't have that, uh, that heavy outlet with figure four anymore. So, um, yeah, but I mean, it, it works for the band because we've always had those like heavier breakdowns and, you know, kind of faster, thrashier type elements in our music. They're just coming out a little more now. <laughs> and that's, you know, um, it, it's the album itself is such a beautiful mixture of a lot of the really key elements that make comeback kid as fun as they are. You know, yes, they got these absolutely, um, you know, uh, face melting kind of thrashy type riffs, these brutal breakdown, uh, you know, breakdown style things to them, whatever you want to call them, because I, I know breakdown is very much becoming a fucking taboo word in music today. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's also one thing that I noticed about this record that really stands out to me personally is it's incredibly anthemic. It's it's like the sing along the sing along value of this record is is throwback all the way to fucking uh, to Wake the Dead. Um, is there something in particular that brought that out while you were while you were writing this record? Was there was or was it just a natural part of it? And when you get to take the time, you get to write these bangers that are very um, crowd incorporated. Right. Um, well, I think it's a bit of both. There, I think it does come very naturally, just because. I mean, that's how the band started. That was kind of like a huge part of our sound and our identity. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time. Um, it's also important as we get older, I think, to the, the, there, there's a certain creative element that always wants to maybe leave what has been done and do something completely different. Sure. But at the same time, I think it's important to have that anchor where it's like, this is our sound and kind of focus on the, the ideas that are coming out that kind of like make sense in the spirit of that because it, it, there, there have been a lot of older bands that, you know, they'll, they'll have three records that sound a certain way. And then all of a sudden, boom, this fourth record just sounds completely out of the blue. And, you know, the band got bored and they just wanted to do something different. Yeah. And while I can respect that to a degree, I really feel it lets fans down. And to me personally, it's very important to kind of like stick with the theme. Like it's like, if, if, if we can't write music, that sounds like Comeback Kid, then it's done. And we have to move on to other projects and, and whatever. So, like, as far as my vault goes of ideas, like, I mean, I'm still very much in that. And those, those like, I, I still feel like there's more in the well. 
And, you know, that's kind of how we felt about that record was like, yeah, we could do all kinds of things. Like we could make a crushing heavy record or we could, you know, really chase the sing-along poppy element that might put us on a bigger stage, but it's probably a bad gamble. Um, well, why not? So, yeah, I just, I just think I just think the important thing, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, we, we kind of do have those elements, right? So it's yeah. like we kind of have the best of both worlds, so let's just do comeback, in which makes a lot of sense for, you know, just where we are because we still feel it's a bit of a relevant sound. Like, we don't feel like any of our records sound, like, super dated. Like, maybe there's elements that someone could point out that it does, but I oh, think, I, I I think they've, aged, they've aged well. Yeah, so. oh, very, very, very well. And, I mean, especially considering, like, the climate of today um, with the different ways that, that metal and hardcore and metalcore are, are taking direction. Oh, yeah. So, like, metalcore, every three years, like, there's there's a new flavor of the month, and, you know, disappointing. six, six eight years down the road, it sounds weird, right? It, yeah. it, it's not... Yeah, so I, I feel like we've we've been fortunate to kind of just, you know, stay the course, even though sometimes it is tempting to like, oh, this is happening right now. That's kind of cool. I can see how we could incorporate that. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it might not be the, the best move for us. It all goes to the same old saying, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But you can throw some bells yep. and whistles on it if you want, you know. Oh, for um, sure. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, I, I also think our parameters are pretty wide where we do have a wide range of things that we can do that still sound like comeback kid. We're not like, it's not so static that we have to just keep it to a oh, very absolutely. tight parameter. So, yeah. Well, th- like I said, that, that is in the beauty of, of your diversity is that you have such a, a, a realm of like, we do do all of the key things that people like to listen to in this, in these like broad genres of music. So comeback is always going to be like a household staple in that sense, you know? Um, but uh, bring it back to you, you know, uh, to, to how you were feeling about the record. Um, I may have to make you eat those words a little bit about it being your favorite record because uh, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna ask you to rank where you put Outsider in the you know relatively healthy um, uh, catalog of Comeback Kid. How do you rank it in terms of a couple of different um, uh, categories? And you know, you give me your thoughts on it. So. Uh, sure. Starting out, uh, how do you rank it in terms of writing the actual record? Like, how, what was the ease of it? What was some of the complications of it? Um, you know, where does it sit in terms uh, or versus writing the other records that come back and could have put out in the, uh, you know, in the time that you've been alive? Hmm. Um, probably somewhere in the middle. Um, some stuff can very easy. Uh, for me, once I get started, the idea is tend to flow. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the more difficult parts, just because I am an introvert and I'm speaking for myself personally, is just when we get in the room and start like hashing out ideas. Um, you know, sometimes we have this complete song and it's pretty ready to go. And then someone has an issue with something. And then all of a sudden we can just like rip the whole thing apart and then rebuild it. And while that's a very healthy process, it's not a fun process. Yeah, it's not an easy sure. process. You have several different opinions in the room of like what direction, you know? So in all honesty, you know, that, that, that is always for me, that's, a, that's, that's, a, those are always the, the high end anxiety points. Cause I always feel like there's, everybody has so much at stake. Cause you put so much value in mm-hmm. um, just what, like, cause it's, it's not for the sake of ego necessarily. It's like, you have this grand vision of like how this song is going to be. And then it starts to change course and you get a little worried. Yeah. But at the same time, I think it's important just to be able to let go of some of that, just to see where where it can wind up. For sure. And yeah, it's not the easiest process, but it is an important one when you're collaborating with uh, you know your fellow bandmates. So I would, it, it wasn't the hardest, it wasn't the easiest. This was somewhere in the middle. I don't know exactly where I could peg it, but yeah, yeah this is usual. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so next, where would you rank it in terms of recording the album? Uh, in terms of how easy it was or hard or, to Yeah, uh, either or. You know, was it the most difficult? Was it the easiest? Was it neither? You know, um, was there anything special about the recording process that puts it in a particular ranking? For me, it would have been, I don't know if the easiest, but one of the easier, easier ones. Um, you know, a friend of ours tracked it, and that made, and he, you know, just working with a, a personality that I have known for a long time, um, that made it much easier than working with someone who I'm not as tight with on a friendship level yeah. where I feel like I'm really under the microscope. Like, you know, when you got that three second part that you just can't nail and you've done it 40 times, 
it's it's just nice to be able to be in, be in an atmosphere where you can relax a little bit, For sure. you know, and then give it another shot. Because you know, and, and nothing against the people that we've recorded with before, but if I'm just not as tight, I just feel like it's a more professional atmosphere where it's less um, fun. It, it's it's nothing around that part. Yeah. It's really it's it's, yeah. it's not as enjoyable when it's not a dude no. that can and laugh at you. You know, I'm not. I, I'll be honest. I'm not the greatest guitar player in the world, so there's parts that I struggle with, and it does take a little bit of time. So it's it's great working with someone where you feel that patience is uh, is uh, you know extended to you, so to speak. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I, I think this record is definitely, uh, you know, more um, manageable from my from my angle to track in a in an upbeat kind of a way. Awesome. And last but not least, um, how do you, where would you rank the songs off of this record or any any part of it in terms of performing it so far? How does it adapt to a live setting versus um, tunes off your previous records? Um, well, that's a bit of a longer answer that I'd have to give you. I'll try to make it as short as I can, but I feel like the first two records, they translated immediately. Like, yeah. Turn It Around came out, boom, like, our shows are crazy. Wake the Dead came out, and, you know, sometimes you have that sofa more jinx, but, you know, it, it, it crushed it live. Like, it was amazing. Then Broadcasting came out. That was a struggle, because we had not only um, switch vocalists, but our sound had kind of changed slightly, yeah. you know, to a darker, sort of more brooding kind of sound. And those songs took some time. And it took probably about a year, year and a half till we felt like, ah, these songs are starting to go. Same thing with Symptoms and Cures. Like, those songs did not pop off very, very quickly live. But Die Knowing, and especially this one, immediately. Like, yeah. I mean, it's still, it's still growing, but like on this last record, um, like absolute somewhere somehow and certain control like those are immediate like bangers live which you know it, it, it we we're hoping for but not expecting um you always hope that they pop off yeah, but uh right. yeah it's uh they they, they translate live really well and you know i think even assuming we make more records that those are going to be like staples in the set okay. you know yeah I look forward to that very much so. And I'm actually really, really, really glad you brought up Absolute. We're in the home stretch here. Um, I would be a little ashamed of myself if I didn't actually get a chance to ask you, Devin fucking Townsend, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> well, we had uh, we have several connections in within the band. Um, so well, he's been Stu... buying drugs off him, haven't he? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think he's clean now. Oh, um, is he? I think so. I think he's been clean for a few years now. So. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think, I think. I don't know him personally, but uh, anyways, uh, Stu, our other guitar player, he he joined the band in uh, 2012. He played in, well, he still plays in Misery City. He's back in the band. Yeah. But anyways, they, they recorded um, with Devin Townsend years ago. Uh, Malice, I believe, was the record that they did with him. And maybe there was a second one, I'm not sure, but Malice, I'm 99% sure, was, was done with Devin. And so we had that connection. And then Andrew, he also um, has another band called Sights and Sounds. And they did their record Monolith um, with with Devin, so we had those two uh, two connections to him already. So basically, what we did was that song was uh, Andrew generally is a last minute lyric writer. Okay. So in the studio, he's running all these ideas, boom, boom, boom. You know, this is going on, that's going on. We're like, wait a minute, this kind of has that sort of Devin feel to it. And we're in Vancouver, and he's got a producer studio just next door. Maybe we should see if he'd be interested. So, you know, Andrew got a hold of him, and, like, and he was like, didn't didn't seem like super stoked in, on the idea, but he's like, just send it to me, and uh, I'll, I'll send it to me with the lyrics or whatever, and I'll uh, I'll let you know. So he got back not too not too much later, and he's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll I definitely want to do something on here. So he just sent us all kinds of insane stuff like that. He just recorded on his own. He didn't come to our studio, but he just, so it was all you know, did it in his, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did it all in his studio because he's a producer as well. Right. So he had, and he's got all these crazy ideas. So there's a bunch of, he, he, he just sent us all the tracks and he's like, use whatever you think makes the most sense for it. I put all kinds of stuff. So like, I don't even know how many tracks there were like 15, 20 different like ideas that he was just throwing out. So we, uh, we just used the ones that we thought made the most sense for, you know, guesting on a band like, like Comeback Kids record. So yeah, it ended up being like one of the, one of the highlights of the record, I think oh, for me personally, anyways, because I think he's a genius. 
Yeah, no, and I, and that was like, uh, you know, going back to the nuclear blast thing a little bit, um, I think that was the first thing I noticed. It's like, okay, so you signed to a major metal label, and now you've got Devin Townsend on a fucking song. <laughs> I don't know how this happened, but I like yeah. it. Yeah, no, I mean, that was completely separate from nuclear blast. Like, I think, you know, our record wasn't good to It was just we had that, we were lucky enough to have that, that connection with the, with the two guys in the band that, uh, that have worked with him before, so that was an easy game. That's fucking cool. That's actually a really... Uh, and, and it's also uh, very much an attestment to his character a little bit. Like, here, I made you 17 tracks. Just pick one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I don't know what he was what he was doing that crazy night, but it was like some of the stuff is just so, like, Bohemian Rhapsody, like, ah, you know, like all these crazy harmonies. And yeah, it sounds just like, like that. Oh, that's a little too over the top, but it's still <laughs> sick just to hear him, like, you know, just toss out a hundred different ideas for that part. I'll bet you he ran a pool as to which one you guys are going to take. Like, <laughs> and just have would, these crazy over-unders. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'd love to see that. <laughs> yeah, just to entertain himself. Um, or maybe so, he sent us stuff just to fuck with us, too. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine he only sent you the operatic one, and you're like, uh, um, yeah. you know, it's cool, man, never mind. <laughs> uh, so wrapping it up a little bit, we know you guys got a tour coming through Canada in a minute. Um, what can we expect uh, from that tour, and what can we expect from the future of Comeback Kid from here? Um, yeah, so we are finally, we have never played a show with No Warning, and, you know, we're both, like, older Canadian hardcore bands, and I know they haven't been super active, like, you know, for the last, you know, how many years, but, um, you know, the idea was pitched to them, and they were down with the idea, so I think it's super cool that, uh, you know, we were able to do this cross Canada run with them. Um, there's a lot of Canadian cities, especially, I think, in Western Canada that uh, kind of got... Uh, missed. I think they, they played a reasonable amount of shows in uh, Ontario and Quebec and whatnot back in the day, but uh, Western Canada was uh, was uh, always wanting, but it rarely rarely happened, or if if ever, with certain cities. So yeah, we're super psyched on uh, you know being able to do that with them. And uh, I don't know, touring Canada and Paul is kind of our thing, and uh, we, I don't I don't know why, but we always. It, we, that 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 part of the year always gets blocked off for Canada because that it, it just seems like it uh, it's the it's the best time of year for for us to go across. We tried a few different things, but uh, that's the one that always that's the one that always pops off. So no, we're just just like to be able to you know do it and still feel like we're churning out re- relevant music and people are uh, appreciating it and coming out. So there's not too much more I can say beyond that because it's really uh, we feel really really lucky to be able to you know, still be doing this. For sure, man. So with that said, you know, all of these years, all of these records, all of these tours, all of these places in the world that you've seen, um, it's a little bit of a standard for your bucket list to, to, to go for the cheap op and ask you, what is left on your bucket list personally, um, either for yourself or for the band? What would you still like um, to try and attain? I'd still like to hit a few countries we haven't hit because I know we've, we've played somewhere around 50 countries and uh, there's, what, just under 200 countries in this world. Mm-hmm. I don't think we can even hit half of them, but I still think there's a handful that, uh, that we, could, we could play that there, there's, there's a fan base. Um, you know, we haven't played the Philippines. We haven't played in, like, proper China. We played Hong Kong, but we haven't played, uh, you know, in China. I think we could probably even pull off a country or two in, uh, in Africa, Mm-hmm. And there, I don't know. There might, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just love love giving everything a chance. Um, you know, even if it's just 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 once, just to be able to just be able to do it and give those fans a chance to to see the band. So fuck yeah, fuck yeah. Well, that's all I've got for you, man. Uh, for anybody listening in the Montreal area, Comeback Kid is going to be coming through at uh, Catacombs on the 15th of September with Comeback Kid, No Warning, Higher Power, and Death Nap. It is going to be a fucking banger show. You will catch me there probably missing a limb at some point or another. Jeremy, it's been a fucking pleasure talking with you, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, is there anything else you want to say to the people before I let you go? Uh, well, Montreal is always one of our favorite places to play. And that's not just trying to butter up a crowd. It's like, which it is, uh, you know, a home away from home in so many ways, because, uh, that like when we, when we played there for the first time with hundred demons, that, that, that will always be uh, stuck in my memory. Just the reaction we got. And, uh, it's always been, it's always been awesome. 
Oh yeah, we're, we're so. very mentally yeah. unstable here. Like it's not a uh, yeah. We don't we don't my people my people <laughs> exactly <laughs> lose your shit, bitches. Um, again, thank you very much for your time, Internet. You've been listening to Bucket List Music Reviews, and have yourself a good awesome day, man. All right, you too. Appreciate the time as well. I'll be there.